Welcome to Buddha at the Gas Pump. My name is Rick Archer. Buddha at the Gas Pump is an ongoing series of conversations with spiritually awakening people. We've done nearly 600 of them now. And if this is new to you and you'd like to check out previous ones, go to batgap.com, B-A-T-G-A-P, and look under the past interviews menu. This program is made possible through the support of appreciative listeners and viewers. So if you appreciate it and would like to help support it, there's a PayPal button on every page of the site. And there's also a, a page that explains other ways to do it if you don't want to use PayPal or have any problem with it. My guest today is Richard Tarnas. Um, Richard is a professor of psychology and cultural history at the California Institute of Integral Studies my alma mater in my next lifetime, um, in San Francisco, where he founded the graduate program in philosophy, cosmology, and consciousness. <clears throat> he teaches courses in the history of ideas, archetypal studies, depth psychology, and religious evolution. He frequently lectures on archetypal studies. Oh, wait a minute. Excuse me. Oh, he, he frequently lectures on those topics at Pacifica Graduate Institute in Santa Barbara and was formerly the Director of Programs and Education at Esalen Institute in Big Sur, California, where he studied with Stanislav Groff, Joseph Campbell, Gregory Bateson, Houston Smith, and James Hillman. He received his Ph.D. from Saybrook Institute in 1976 with a dissertation on LSD psychotherapy, psychoanalysis, and spirit, spiritual transformation. He is the author of the Patch, I'm going to show the books here as I name them, <clears throat> Osher, author of The Passion of the Western Mind, A History of the Western Worldview from the Ancient Greek to the Postmodern, widely used in universities, and his second book, Cosmos and Psyche, Intimations of a New World Order, received the Book of the Year Prize from the Scientific and Medical Network and is the basis for the upcoming documentary series, The Changing of the Gods. Um, he is the past president of the International Transpersonal Association and served on the Board of Governors for the C.G. Young Institute of San Francisco. Uh, so, welcome, Richard. Thank you, Rick, for having yeah, me. Yeah, great to have you. What's happening with that, um, that uh, what is it, video series, uh, documentary series? Oh, the doc yeah. yeah, the documentary series, uh, Changing of the Gods. That's uh, they're in their final um, stages of editing. It's a 10, 10 episode series, and um, I know they're going through the final um, polishing of and editing, putting in the int integrating the, the the music and soundtrack to um, uh, the kind of level that is appropriate for the public. So anyway, they're in their last stages. I think it's going to be later this year, 2021, that it will be coming out. Good. And it will be how, well, on YouTube or on some pay-per-view thing know, or what? Uh, I think, they're, uh, I think they're, they've got a, uh, a distribution. Honestly, um, I, because I'm not making the film myself, uh, I'm not privy to all the – but I, I believe they've got a, a special way of uh, – making it available rather than going through Netflix. They have another kind of uh, independent way of doing it that they're very um, pleased about. Okay. So should be interesting. Rick, if, yeah, I could just, go ahead. if I could just mention um, one slight correction in the uh, title for uh, Cosmos and mm -hmm. Psyche, the, the subtitle is Intimations of a New World View. Uh, rather than intimations of a new world oh, order. Oh, brother! It's, it says uh, "new world view" right here. That, that that shows you that's a Freudian slip, if ever there was one. <laughs> it, I, I only bring that up because, of course, a new, uh, new world order, world order, very much brings back uh, memories of, of of certain American foreign policy uh, imperatives that I didn't necessarily subscribe no, to. No, I agree. And. Uh, and so I'm I'm working much more at the level of philosophical, religious, uh, and um, cosmological worldview. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. It says or it says view in my notes here. I, I just I mean that's such a sure. kind of a conspiratorial phrase these days. It's kind of in, in yes. the zeitgeist. So it kind of <laughs> I just slipped up. <clears throat> yeah. Um, so I was thinking as I read, you know. 
I, as I was telling you earlier, I've listened to 10 or 12 hours of your other talks and interviews and read quite a lot of things. And um, I've tried to sort of distill it down to what to me would be the most interesting things to talk about. And I want to make sure that you get to do the same and that we, between us, we cover those aspects of your work that most uh, inspire us both. Um, one, f one for me, which is a sort of a s distillation, I think, of what you're trying to say in Cosmos and Psyche, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that consciousness or intelligence is fundamental to the universe, pervades it, and, and can even be seen to comprise it, such that nothing is random, accidental, or arbitrary, and everything is in infinitely correlated. So that's that's one key point, right? Do you agree with that? Well, I would put it slightly differently. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it's in it, definitely in that direction in the sense of um, that we live in a kind of pan-psychic and souled universe, that it's intelligent and um, uh, spiritually informed. Uh, and at some deep level, uh, conscious, uh, though not every expression of the cosmos is equally conscious, as we all know. Um, and, uh, but I, I don't think I would say that there's nothing, um, I don't know, what's, what's the, the words like random, accidental, uh, uh, I, I don't think that we're living out a, a blueprint that has every single uh, detail uh, predetermined. I think we live in an open universe and the the cosmos is itself a, a continuing, as I understand it, a, a continuing, uh, evolving, creative act. And that creativity brings in a certain amount of unpredictability. It's bringing together multiple uh, um, movements and infusions and, and uh, impulses in each moment of our consciousness, as well as in every other part of the cosmic uh, um, panoply of other consciousnesses. And so there's a certain amount of, there's a play in the system. There's, there's a, a, a kind of creative unpredictability that is crucial in my understanding to, um, the, the human adventure. Uh, if, if, if we were just living out a kind of predetermined, uh, structure of, of, of fate, um, that would be a less, le a less interesting adventure for sure. And even though I think there is a constant interplay between underlying karmic factors, underlying uh, archetypal um, uh, and cosmological structures and, and uh, um, evolutionary stages and so forth that take place collectively as well as individually. There's all sorts of structures that we're working within, but it's more like jazz music, uh, where you, or, 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 or rock and roll or blues, where you have certain, um, formal structures, chordal structures, harmonic, uh, uh um, architecture as it were. And then within that, um, larger, architectural st structure there it's up to us what what uh, melodies we 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 sing you know what what dances we dance um perhaps the genres are to some extent shaped by our culture and our uh, the epoch we're living in um but the i i deeply believe that there's a certain element of human agency of autonomy of of, of creative freedom and that's where our, our our moral responsibility comes in, as well as the the, the playful um, uh, dimension uh, artistically and so forth. Yeah, no, I completely agree with you. And when I say random or or you know nothing is random or accidental or arbitrary, um, I would put it well. I, I concur with everything you just said, but it's sort of like if man is made in the image of God, then I think both we and God are doing improv and that you know when robin williams did improv he obviously had certain learning and experience and he spoke the english language and so there was you know certain skills and and traits that enabled him to do that and and yet you know it was a fluid spontaneous thing and and adaptable to what the audience how the audience responded and so on so um but 
even a random number generator, I would say, um, you know, which by its very name is random, um, it functions on the basis of certain laws of nature and, you know, com the way computer chips are made. And, and if you, you get down deep enough in anything, uh, you find pure intelligence uh, permeating everything and orchestrating everything. But, you know, if, I don't for a minute think that everything is predetermined or, or set uh, in some rigid way. Right, right. I, I didn't, I only was trying to uh, clarify those uh, terms, yeah. Clarify in terms of my own, uh, because it's, e it's, it's easy when uh, bringing in whether you, you have a sense that there are uh, st stages or structures of the evolution of consciousness, or if you believe that there are um, uh, karmic factors that work in human uh, affairs uh, collectively as well as individually, if you believe that there are uh, archetypal astrological uh, factors that play a role in our in our lives, it's it's rather easy to uh, slip into a fatalistic or you know predetermined way of looking at it. And I I wanted to kind of um, hold that that dialectic or that tension of opposites uh, between the creativity and the order that's constantly uh, at, at at work or at play in our in our lives yeah and you need both i mean you, you need certain stability and and uh structure and order and then also creativity if you had all of one or all of the other you'd either have rigidity or chaos it seems to me uh, absolutely the uh, uh thomas kuhn you know who wrote yeah i was just thinking that as, as you're saying yeah yeah, so he's yeah, so we, he's one of his books uh, is called The Essential Tension, and he's recognizing, of course, his whole theory of the structure of scientific revolution is is an interplay between normal science, which is more structured and and uh, you do your research and you do your thinking within uh, the structure, uh, the enduring structure. Of, of certain assumptions, certain uh, frame of reference that is passed on pedagogically and, and from scientist to, to student and you know, professors, et cetera. But uh, the, the, the great scientific breakthroughs, um, the innovations, whether it's Copernicus or, 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 or Darwin or um, the uh, tectonics revolution, whatever it happens to be, is a uh, involves a kind of Promethean creative act, a kind of re revolution that takes place. Uh, and there has to be that creativity, that questioning. But if you just have nothing but, if, if Copernicus or Darwin didn't know their tradition really well, uh, if Copernicus hadn't really studied um, the, the science and history of astronomy from the ancients through the medieval period, he could never it, what his theory would have been a flash in the pan, but he was able to ground it in the in the tradition, no knowledgeably. And the, the same thing with Darwin, same thing with uh, um, Jung or whoever. They 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 they're working with that essential tension. Yeah, and if the established paradigms could be flipped with the arrival of every new bit of information, again, we wouldn't have any stability. Everything would be chaos. Uh, so there's a certain value in their being resistant to anomalies, right? But then when the anomalies become overwhelming, they eventually have to shift. So, so it's kind of stability and adaptability, kind of counterbalancing each other, as I see it. Yes, and uh, yeah, that's that's perfect. And uh, and I think the the sign of I think it was Kuhn himself who put it that you know the sign of a really uh, powerful new uh, theory is the degree of resistance that it gets from yeah. Yeah. The, those holding the old paradigm. Mm -hmm. uh, because if it were not seen as a powerful theory, then it would not gain attention. Wouldn't be threatening. It, wouldn't, it wouldn't mount, yeah, it wouldn't mount the resistance uh, or it wouldn't create the resistance. So um, that's something that, oh, somebody like Rupert, uh, Rupert Sheldrake, who, who I know you've also had on your, on your um, series here, and as a good friend, uh, he, he, of course, you know, 
met with tremendous resistance and, and has all these years, you know, pretty consistently from, you know, particularly, well, both the British and the American uh, kind of conventional scientific establishment. And uh, I think that's the exact uh, measure of his cogency of uh, and how well he knows both the tradition and the anomalies that he is he's coming up with a new new uh, hypothesis about. Yeah. And since we're on this theme, uh, why do you think it is that um, materialists uh, are, you know, digging in their heels so desperately? And why is it they feel so threatened by the suggestion that, you know, consciousness is fundamental and not merely a product of the brain? <clears throat> Very good question. And I think I think there's a, a, a number of factors you know, to some extent it comes, uh, it's a matter of uh, almost like typology. You know, some people just have easier access to, some people have more, let's call it epistemological armoring, you know, more uh, uh, resistance to um, either new ideas or new, or new uh, ways of framing their universe, um, or they have, uh, more of a uh, psychological investment in the theory that they've been working with all their lives. They may have a professional investment. They, they, they may have many professional papers written that take for granted the mater materialistic worldview. So I think part of it can be seen as psychological, biographical, career professional uh, uh, issues. But then I think there's deeper things happening as well. Um, I think to s materialism as it came into the ascendant in the course of the Enlightenment, for example, the, 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 the European Enlightenment, uh, the radical Enlightenment of the 18th century in particular, uh, more in France than almost anywhere else, but also in England to a great extent. And that, um, that mechanistic materialism offered a a way of definitively holding the power of Christianity and the theological uh, and religious practices and, and the, po the, the power of the Vatican and all sorts of things that had been um, overthrown to, to uh, or certainly began, a revolution began very powerfully in the 15th, 16th uh, centuries, re the Reformation, and then the uh, uh, even the Renaissance is playing with it uh, to some extent, uh, but particularly with the Reformation, it breaks into many different uh, ways of uh, enacting Christianity, and then, uh, but the power of the of the monarchical Catholic Church was at that point uh, fragmented, and and much more free thought started coming in. And then you get uh, the scientific revolution, which offers um, a way in which the European mind was able to agree on something while the wars of religion were tearing Europe apart. And so there was a, uh, here was a, a perspective that would be available to anybody using um, their own empirical and rational capacities they anybody could look through the telescope and see the see the results and then there could all all the different features of the modern scientific ethic uh offered a a way out of the almost suicidal um clashing of different forms of christianity that was tearing apart europe so that was a factor um and then there's the whole I think really deep level of emancipation from the belief in hell, uh, the belief that there is a, um, a, a, a cruelly judging God uh, overseeing uh, every action uh, and, and thought, and that if you screw up, um, you can go uh, have eternal damnation. And I think, um, when, 
while the telescope and the Newtonian, Cartesian, and subsequent theories opened up uh, a cosmos that seemed it it seemed to uh, eliminate the, the possibility that that the earth that at the center of the earth was hell which was the medieval belief you know as you see in dante and so forth and while it didn't show the angels and god out in the heavens and certainly in any literal way uh it also uh kind of and it would, and that's the disenchantment you know there suddenly the the cosmos is seen as being just you know matter in motion uh no deeper meaning it's not focused on the earth uh the divine uh uh, order is not being expressed through the the celestial the, the divine intelligence is no longer being shown through the movements of the planets uh and the sun and moon around the earth with the earth as a as the focus of divine and cosmic attention it's just suddenly the earth is spinning out into a, a cosmic void uh but at the great liberation of humankind to be able to um, chart its own destiny and to frame uh, its its future with according to human values that took this life seriously and that um, uh, helped people let's say embrace their their physical their erotic existence uh, without guilt or all, all sorts of things that were part of the enlightenment's attempt to liberate itself from what it saw as the oppressiveness of the um, of the church and the medieval period and the, the price that was paid for that of course that was that by freeing our cosmology uh, from and our ontology like as in materialism from any uh, from there being no spiritual dimension that was being expressed through it um it it freed the modern mind from one particular interpretation of the spiritual order of the universe but in doing so it seemed to eliminate the possibility of there being any spiritual order uh it just erased the whole um uh spiritual dimension a, as being anything other than the projection of human consciousness which itself was just a accidental epiphenomenon of the complexity of material evolution which isn't a very strong um, uh, basis upon which to uh, believe in the in spiritual values and and so we have both the the crisis of modern spiritual alienation combined with the uh, new freedom that got that was opened up by human beings living in an open universe that was not predetermined by a an angry god mm. and we also have you know huge technological innovation and transformation of the world through that and destruction of the world through that um so do you think that we now may be on the in the process not only on the verge of but in the midst of a transformation that's as significant as the renaissance as the scientific revolution um into something entirely not entirely new but perhaps something which incorporates the best of um you know objective science with the best of subjective you know, or, or mystical traditions. <clears throat> there certainly are uh, many signs of something like that happening. And uh, of course, depending on the interpretive lens that you uh, approach the daily news with or, or take in the, um, the zeitgeist, you can see signs of, uh, uh, of encouragement in that direction or signs of despair. Um, uh, because of also the spread of of uh, hatred or you know racism or uh, the or the conviction that or or the power of corporate um, 
commodification of of the environment uh, and of, of human beings uh, continuing uh, at at such a rapid pace. My sense is that the crisis of that the the climate crisis, the even to some extent the pandemic, um, uh, but the climate crisis is of course the larger looming epic. Uh, um, destruction of the of the of the entire Cenozoic um, eco- biosphere, and this kind of um, the level of of destruction and and extreme change that is being uh, constellated for so many human beings around the world. And right in in this very moment, you know, whether it's in her, it's it's social, it's economic, it's uh, in gender, it's uh, it's in uh, race, it's in class, it's in um, uh, our relationship to the larger Earth community and all the species that are being threatened or, or made extinct by our by the human presence and industrial civilization, etc. There's something like a a descent going on, I think, in our time, um, a descent out of the previous confident modern sense of progress, civilized progress through human reason and and uh, perhaps through capitalism or through uh, some, you know, uh, through democracy, certainly. Uh, and um, all, all those convictions are now being uh, questioned and reconceived, and what do we want to preserve, and what is what is so problematic that we might be destroying the the foundations of of our human future? And uh, if we were to think of this in terms of like a, there are so many signs that in a way humanity is going through something like a spiritual emergency, or a, or a, what what Stan Groff called it, a spiritual emergency. Emergent. He was playing with the word emergency and emergence. Um, uh, you can also see it as being very much like a uh, like a near death experience, um, and we're we're facing mortality on a planetary scale. We're facing um, a, a deep deconstruction of our old identity. Who is what is the human being? Uh, we went from being the crown of creation to now many. Um, conscientious, thoughtful people look upon the human species as being the most problematic species on the planet that is that is causing um, the whole tremendous harm, like a like a like a like a like a cancer or a or a um, malefic virus. Uh, and so, um, this deep questioning of who we are, of our identity, the the. The, the physical suffering, the spiritual uh, alienation, um, the, the facing of mortality, these are all classic signs of a, um, of an, of a, like a, an initiatory um, rite of passage. Uh, all these things like uh, Joseph Campbell or, or uh, Eliada would have discussed in terms of the, um, the structure of the the great rituals that have informed indigenous traditional societies, archaic, uh, ancient um, mystery religions, and so forth, they had um, they they had and have these um, initiatory rituals in which w- the individual is taken away uh, from the collective, from the community, from 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 the, the young boy is taken away from the the tribe or from the mothers, uh, uh, and is put through a crisis um, in order to become a, a, a shaman, or in order, or or the whole generation of boys or girls is, are put through a um, a transformational crucible of experience that's quite intense, uh, that in, involves facing death. It involves. Um, Kind of destroying one's old identity, and that separation, uh, and and well, out of that comes the possibility of re- of connecting to the deepest um, 
the deeper purposes and meanings and forces that are at work in, uh, in, in life and death. And in doing so, it allows uh, in, the, in the movement from the dying into the rebirth, there is a coming into the world in a way that allows us to um, see ourselves as being part of a larger unfolding whole that we have a kind of mature responsibility for like thinking seven generations hence instead of just the current quarterly profit report i mean you could say our our, our modern society is to some extent constituted by people who have not gone through initiatory rites of passage transformations and in some sense are still locked into a very short-term adolescent um, uh, mentality that is uh, causing uh, great great havoc to the, to the world. There's no there's no uh, adults in the room, or at least very few, at the level of the levers of power. Yeah, adolescent mentality is a good phrase. I mean, you know, I'm lucky to have made it through my adolescence alive, <laughs> um, <laughs> and uh, you know, many people could say the same. And I, I sort of have the feeling that in a way that you know, all of humanity is kind of in its adolescence now and we're, we're behaving like crazy teenagers and, you know, hopefully we'll, we'll make it through this without, you know, killing ourselves. A um, couple other thoughts I just want to throw in there and then I'll let you, let you respond. Um, one, one thing I've always found fascinating is that when you think back to any previous time, you know, the 1920s or the 1860s or the 1600s or whatever, people living in that society um, just kind of took for granted that the world in which they live, that it, it, it's normal, things are just like this. And, you know, they, they couldn't really imagine how different things might be, even in the not too distant future, much less, you know, 100, 200 years later. And I often think that about our world and, you know, what changes might be just around the corner or even 100 years from now that we're not we're not even conceptualizing you know we don't even foresee um we'll go ahead and riff on that before i say anything more yeah i certainly uh, agree that we are um there's an acceleration of history that's very tangible we can all feel it uh it i mean to some extent time seems to accelerate as we get older um I'm, I'm sure you have the experience, not unlike me, of that our birthdays seem to be happening uh, every three months now, <laughs> rather than uh, the 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 nice long year that used to separate when we were young. Um, and uh, but I think there's also a collective acceleration of history that's happening that you know even the young feel. Uh, and of course, our technology, uh, not only the advance of technology, but even the very quality of our experience, let's say, is mediated by um, uh, the computer, the internet, the digital uh, media, um, social media, uh, uh, the rapidity of images. If you turn on uh, to watch a, uh, a basketball game and the, and, the, um, and the advertisements come on and the, the number of images and narrative shifts per 15 seconds is astonishing compared to what it was even in you know the 1960s or 70s um, so things are definitely uh, accelerating which is not unlike what people experience at you know i've done i did have worked for many many years with stan groff uh we we um both lived at esalen institute together and worked there starting uh in the in the uh 73 74 and and have taught together for uh, you know some 40 years and one of the things I, I i definitely learned from him is the the importance of the perinatal uh process the the death rebirth level of the deep psyche that people seem to access when they go into um deep self-exploration through you know uh, methods that uh activate the the deep unconscious whether it's um you know use of psychedelics or holotropic breath work or certain forms of meditation etc and uh one of the things that seems to happen in the later stages of the like where you're you're 
you're re reliving your birth, you're also encountering what feels like a, your death. Partly it's the, it's the death of, you don't quite realize it when you're in the middle of it, but it's the dying of the womb that you've been in, you know, the dying of the old, the aquatic uh, life that you've had in, in the uh, prenatal state and the unity with not only the maternal womb, but really the sense of unity with everything. The unity, you know, you're in an undifferentiated uh, unity with 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 nature, with with the great mother, with the universe. Um, and suddenly, you're being expelled and isolated uh, uh, in a in a quite overwhelming way. And as that process um, reaches a climax prior to birth. There, there tends to be a tremendous kind of acceleration, like um, uh, an increase of, of volume and, and tension. It's, you know, you, you know the uh, the famous um, in the Beatles, uh, Sergeant Pepper uh, album, where they have a the, day in the um, life, where where the thing goes. A uh, day in the life. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Very powerful. Yeah, it's great. Uh, yeah, it, it was something that. Uh, George Martin, the great producer for the, the Beatles, put together, but uh, on, on, at the suggestion, I think it was of John Lennon. Um, but in any case, that captures that sense of we're moving up to a kind of almost unsustainable level of accelerated tension. And uh, and that's that's in, happening right right now to a great extent. And it's combining with this feeling that I was pointing out before about that, you know, how in initiatory rituals you're, you know, the, the, the shaman to be the, the, the boy that's put out onto the ice in the igloo by the Northern American, uh, uh, shamanic, uh, teacher and is put into isolation for, for, for like an entire month and doesn't get to see anybody is just given a little water and a little food every once in a while, uh, into the, into the, uh, little ice hut that they're in. And, um, and they go through a lot, but during that, there's something about our current condition that was partly constellated by the modern mind, which is to have separated human consciousness from the, from the cosmic community of subjects that we're part of. In other words, we became the only conscious, purposeful being in a vast cosmos that to our knowledge had no other conscious, pur purposeful beings capable of meaning, capable of spiritual, moral aspiration, and so forth. Uh, and this is a, this conviction, which is part of the materialistic worldview, uh, it, it has created a, a deep sense of alienation, but it's a, it's a gestalt. It's a, it's a, it's a particular filtering out of a lot of uh, data and an imposition of a particular frame of reference on one's experience. It represents a kind of archetypal complex in a way. And I think that complex is part of a larger process of unfolding that there's an initiatory unfolding of humanity i mean it's this is partly a uh, a conviction of faith on my part of trust in the cosmos of trust in my uh, of the deep psyche that we all the soul the kind of cosmic anima mundi that we all participate in but i think it's it's also uh something that i am inferring from a lot of evidence i think there's a lot that it, it it makes sense to me and i think and it makes sense to a lot of other people too that we see we seem to be almost being prepared to go through uh, through something that will uh, create the possibility of a participatory enhanced relationship with uh, the larger community of being that's my hope, uh, and I th it's not a slam dunk uh, ritual where all, all the elders are in the middle of it too. In, instead of the elders aren't controlling it, you know, from outside the tri outside the uh, initiatory um, ritual, we're we're all in it together, and so we we're just kind of seeing through a glass darkly. Yeah, 
One thing that might differentiate it from the initiatory rituals of traditional cultures is that in those, the, the young people going through the initiation rites knew that that's what they were getting into, you know. And it was probably explained to them, okay, you're going to go out in this igloo, or you're going to go up on this mountaintop, and you're not going to have any food or whatever, and they, they knew what they were up against. But I think perhaps the whole society is going through such a thing now, and yet the vast majority of people have, not, have no idea that that's what they're going through. And, and so their preparedness or their ability to go through it is seriously compromised. And, you know, a lot of people are having a real hard time of it. Yeah, we, in a sense, by having a, a society that has not uh, had sacred rites of passage as part of it means that we can't recognize the, um, the, the larger pattern that might be unfolding. And, you know, if you think about the, um, the, the fetus and the child, the little baby that's being born, uh, it's, they haven't necessarily had preparation either cognitively about what's going, what's, what's happening. Suddenly, you know, this seemingly, uh, all nourishing, um, cosmos that I've been in all my existence is contracting and, and it's making things unbearable. And now it seems to be expelling me right out as if I'm, um, the most negative thing and worthless. And all those feelings tend to get activated when people relive their birth. And, uh, that, that perinatal dimension is quite a, quite a powerful threshold of psychological and spiritual transformation. Have you ever relived and yours? Think, Did that ever happen? I, I, I have, yes, but yeah. I was just curious. Um, I can imagine it as you describe it, and it, it sounds... In yes. fact, I was born by cesarean, so I didn't have to go through all that. But, but even with cesarean, you're... You, you're all of a sudden you in do, this bright light and noise and, yeah, getting spanked. and Yeah, and there's a, there's a tremendous uh, uh, sudden uh, rupture of being uh, and separation from the... Uh, from the universe that you have been embedded in. And so much depends on, after that point, uh, so much depends on, you know, the, the presence of, of the loving reception, you know, that you could get from your, from your mother, from your um, uh, parents and, and family. And, and there can be a kind of healing uh, that, that can happen of that, that rupture to a great extent. But we still all have the birth at different levels of trauma inside us. And um, Stan Groff has done a brilliant job of showing how certain uh, historical uh, collective tendencies seem to be an acting out on a, on a collective scale of perinatal anxieties, uh, projections, um, uh, impulses. But I know uh, your 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 listeners probably a good number of them will know of of, of Gross work and they can they can explore that uh, there. Yeah. Um, okay. So let's shift a little bit to the, or maybe a lot to what you discuss in Cosmos and Psyche. Um, I admittedly have never had a good head for astrology in any form. My wife is pretty uh, good with Jyotish, you know, the Indian astrology. Um, but I learned a lot in, in reading a good portion of your book. And uh, one thing that I got from it is that, um, and you can you know, use this as a springboard to say much more, but that <clears throat> the planets are not... Um, causative and certainly <clears throat> not through some kind of gravitational influence or something like that but rather the whole thing is like this giant sort of uh, coherent or synchronistic clockwork and um, you know what's happening in the macrocosm just happens to correspond in certain ways with what's happening on individual level or societal level and um and if if and you can probably clarify the way I've just described that, but that has very interesting implications in terms of what the universe actually is and how it's actually working. Um, so take it from there and and elaborate a bit. Sure. Uh, 
Yes, in terms of uh, like the clock metaphor, sometimes uh, uh, been suggested uh, as like when if we if we see that it's uh, two p.m. Um, on the clock, the clock is not causing it to be two o'clock. It's indicating it. It's reflecting it. Uh, and in <clears throat> from the uh, as the astrological point of view is it's not that the planet's positions are causing us to be a certain way, uh, this person to be nice and that person to be angry uh, or this person to have a bad week or, or, or year or whatever. It's that um, as, as Plotinus, the great, uh, the great um, Neoplatonic, well, founder of Neoplatonism, but really probably the greatest of the of the uh, ancient classical philosophers uh, after Plato and Aristotle, and he he was describing how he saw astrology work, uh, both against the um, against the skeptics, but also against those astrologers who uh, believed in a fatalistic. Uh, interpretation of the astrological um, correlations and he said the stars are like are like uh like a, a script a language that is in uh written out in the heavens because everything in the world is full of signs the whole world is uh pregnant with 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 signs and symbols and meaning and uh and uh, everything is interconnected uh and then he says as has been said everything breathes together and i love that uh phrase everything breathes together because it um it it suggests a, a living animate universe uh that is um kind of organically spiritually meaningful all the way down uh it doesn't just start at a certain in a certain species or is it with a certain complexity of uh of brain organization or something like that, but that um, we, the human consciousness, uh, the human brilliance and imagination and spiritual aspirations are the universe's consciousness and intelligence and spiritual aspirations as expressed through us. Uh, we're not separate from it. And uh, it, rather, and in a way, this is a superior metaphor, uh, this more organic one, everything breathes together. It's superior to a clock metaphor because, um, of course, the clock is very likely to be interpreted in a sort of Newtonian Cartesian manner, uh, the, the clockwork universe that could be get get pretty mechanistic. Um, and you could have a, a, a deist interpretation of it, you know, where there's God, the clockmaker. Um uh, uh, but it's still that's much more of a mechanistic uh, m metaphor than I believe the astrological evidence um, could could support. The uh, astrology suggests that we live in an archetypally meaningful universe in which the movements of the planets and the and the sun in relationship uh, the the movement of the of the Earth in relationship to the uh, the planetary movements and in relationship to the sun, the moon around the earth, that the that there is a kind of unfolding um, of an unfolding geometry of meaning that seems to be uh, focused on this earth in a certain way. Maybe not only on this earth, but it, but for those of us on earth uh, and who have and you have to kind of cultivate a ca capacity for what James Hillman calls the the archetypal eye, like a capacity for symbolic discernment, for um, you know a kind of ear for the music of the spheres, so to speak. But it's just it's just the kind of um, capacity for symbolic uh, discernment that you would that you would get if you were a good student of literature or or of poetry or of film. Um, in some sense, astrology represents the, the need to bring together the sciences and the humanities together in order to comprehend the, the geometry of meaning that's unfolding. But it's, it's, a, uh, 
it's not that the that the planets are causing things to happen. They're they're more as I was talking earlier. They're they're more like um, providing us with a sense of the great chordal structures that are that are that we all participate in with the world transits, and then each of us with our own birth chart, and we get our personal transits as the planets come into different relationship to where the planets were at your birth. Uh, and we care, we seem to carry certain archetypal potentials that were, uh, uh, as it were, um, symbolized in the positions of the planets uh, and sun and moon at our birth. And we, we, we unfold those in the course of our lives. And it seems to me that that metaphor that I was describing or analogy earlier in our conversation where we, um, it's up to us what, what music we're going to, you know, what what songs we sing, what dances we dance to the to these uh, chordal uh, structures that the planets are symbolizing. The, but I don't think astrology is concretely predictive. I think it 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 is uh, archetypally predictive. It gives us a sense of the larger um, uh, gestalts or frame. Um, uh, matrices of meaning uh, that these powerful multivalent archetypal principles represent Saturn and and uh, uh, Aphrodite, the Sat- you know Venus, uh, uh, Mars, etc. They each have their own kind of cosmos of of meaning that that has both shadow and light, profound and trivial expressions. It's up to us how we uh, uh, express these. I like that phrase that the the universe is breathing or something was that it yeah, yeah. everything breathes everything together. breathes together um you know as i see it as i said in the beginning the whole we're just swimming in a all omnipresent ocean of intelligence and that you can think of the universe as one living breathing being and you know all these substructures being like organs and cells within that being you know galaxies and solar systems Mm -hmm. and planets and so on and so if you think of it that way then you can't possibly think that everything is just dead insentient matter and that it's like just billiard balls bouncing around and and but Mm -hmm. you you just sort of have to see it as alive and um and so it's not a stretch to discern meaning in the movements of planets and their relationship to people and and cultures and so on it you know obviously takes a lot of study and thought to see the specifics of that meaning but the the fact that there could be such meaning is not a great leap of faith yes uh and um the cultivation of the capacity to to perceive the meaning is a is a lifelong um uh, journey in a sense and i like I like uh, Goethe's, uh, you know, the, the, the German poet, scientist, uh, uh, Goethe's idea that um, the development of certain organs of perception actually play, uh, plays a role in um, the, like, we require those, those organs to be able to perceive uh, realities that we would otherwise be blind to and um so that the reality that we know is a kind of co-created um uh, uh, fruit of our attitude towards the world as well as the world's um revelation to us they 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 go together in a kind of uh, mysterious unitive way yeah you quote Newton in your book as having said, exclaim to God, I think thy thoughts after thee. And, you know, I've often sort of liked the phrase that we're, we are sense organs of the, of the infinite. We're kind of like organs of action of the infinite. And, you know, somewhere in my notes, I have you here, you know, suggesting that, um, here we go. Yeah. Um, the, the theory the theory of a Copernicus, a Newton, or an Einstein is not simply due to the luck of a stranger. Rather, it reflects the human mind's ra- radical kinship with the cosmos. 
And so in other words, ideas bubble up in the minds of receptive people when the cosmos wants them to be expressed given the stage of the development of of that particular culture. Right. And that and then the individual who is kind of mediating the breakthrough for the culture is in some sense um uh Sele selected, as it were, by the by the uh, unfolding universe to be the 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 agent of of this breakthrough, to be the expression of it, and, and uh, people that person can have images and and uh, dreams or or um, visions that kind of lead them f forth, or they will meet certain people or read certain books at just the right time that opens up a certain path that that helps get them to the the uh the destination it 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 does seem to be um a kind of uh, it's a mysterious process by which the universe is leading us each of us leading us forth to flower i i like jung's idea of individuation which is that each of us uh and this is also the case for the for the for the great scientific uh, or philosophical breakthrough, um, that each of us is on a journey uh, to, of of individuation, by which Jung did not mean that he, we were just getting separate from the crowd and becoming an individual. That's part of it, but he also had in mind that we need to. Uh, that what we are doing ultimately is a, a good adjective, a, a good synonym for for individuation is flowering. That we, uh, and just as the um, the the redwood tree in my backyard, uh, or the or the mallard duck that has just landed in the pond, uh, uh, they they represent different flowerings of this same universal stuff uh, but it's becoming itself in its own in its own way uh, but it's not like your intelligence and mine and whoever's listening to us we're not like potted plants in our separate <laughs> I isolated um, pots you know we're not oh, what's the uh, Alan Watts's term we're not skin encapsulated egos we um, each of us as plants, as flowers, as in the, the, the universe has flowered in a, in a Rick Archer way in you and uh, in, in, a, in a Richard Tarnas way in me and in, in, in a uh, Jane Austen way in Jane uh, Austen. And each of us is planted in the soil of the earth, not in a pot. pot. We're, we're, we're all nur nurtured by the same cosmic uh, uh, soil and roots and um, you know they've been inflected in particular ways for each of us in ways that help us uh, flower in our particular proper form that's peculiar to us it's unique to our journey but we're we're all expressions of this cosmic intelligence that you've uh, that you alluded to yeah I love that quote from your buddy uh, Brian Swim, you know, you leave hydrogen alone for 13.7 billion years and you end up with rose bushes, giraffes, and opera. Um, it's yeah. like, yeah, uh, exactly. to me, that is a beautiful reference to the fact that the, the universe seems to be a big, giant evolution machine. It has this evolutionary traje trajectory or impetus, and it just kind of keeps pushing and, um, you know, evolving forms more and more capable of you know reflecting and expressing the the infinite intelligence at its at its basis or its essential nature that's right um brian is great we uh <clears throat> we were kind of part of the philosophy cosmology and consciousness program from the from the beginning uh when i started it in um in 1994 and uh and in some sense 
we we kind of sometimes we co taught courses together. We taught one called radical mythos speculation, um, and in some sense, he has always represented that part of our graduate program that has moved from cosmos to psyche, and I represented the movement from psyche to cosmos because um, I came out of the depth psychology tradition, you know, Jung, William James, uh, Stan Groff, uh, and, and others, and uh, Hillman um, were b all major kind of teachers and influences, while uh, Brian was coming more from the cosmo, the, the direct cosmological background. He, he got his doctorate in mathematical cosmology, but unlike many practicing scientists, he had... Um, he had an intuition that the universe was uh, sacred through and through, and that it uh, that his consciousness and our consciousness uh, are expressions of of a uh, of an evolving, um, explosively creative universe, rather rather than the um, the more conventional um, uh, perspective that in a way he's been kind of battling against uh, for uh, all, all his life. And his influences, of course, are Thomas Berry, Teilhard Chardin, um, uh, Alfred North Whitehead, and so forth. Mm. Yeah, to me, it's just hiding in plain sight. I mean, look at a cell under a microscope or even an, an, an inanimate thing under a microscope and, and look and, or understand it really deeply. And it's just this marvel of orderliness and creativity and intelligence. Just and we're just functioning in in that, oh, swimming in that, as I said earlier. But we take it for granted, you know. Just walk down the street and all those, you know, look at all the grass. I mean, if you actually looked at a blade of gra grass closely enough, you'd be astounded at what you're actually walking past. That's right. That's right. So much depends on whether we have eyes to see or not. Mm. Uh, and um, I. I went through a kind of awakening to the natural world in a new way, uh, maybe 10, 12 years ago, uh, just starting to see how the, um, the squirrel on the tree or the, uh, or the tree itself and its leafing were, uh, carrying the same that I also was coming out of the same, uh, evolving, vitality and you know that the that the fence lizard and the squirrel and the bird and i and you all have um we're we we are we all have these four limbs um two of which bend this way uh with our arms you know forward and then the, the legs backwards and uh we um with our the development of the the, the cranium and uh, all these different ways, or or the or the or the tree itself, and it's reaching out towards the with its branches, its limbs, and the and the leaves to to pull in the nourishment of the of the sun, um, and just starting to feel its vibratory, living, uh, and sold presence, and what how I was kin. I was kin to everything there. That that sense of kinship was so much more radical uh, than I had had before. That uh, one can easily, as a whatever, as a philosopher or someone who's uh, interested in human culture and psychology and so forth, it one can perhaps too easily think of just get focused on the human project. And suddenly, I was deeply, deeply interested in every stage of biological evolution and, and how, you know, the Homo sapiens is coming out of the primate uh, uh, lineage and that the primates are part of the, the mammalian uh, class that's part of the, the larger uh, vertebrate or chordate um, phylum and, uh, and who are close, you know, cousins uh, <clears throat> In 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 the next uh, um, in the next order over, uh, I, I just uh, found it and as as interesting now to to know how I am related to the to the horse or to the um, or, or to or or to the um, 
uh, hawk as I was to know how I was related to a certain cousin or uncle or, or you know, it was just a, a whole other feeling. Yeah, and I think if we take it a step deeper, we could say we're, we're just as related to the rock, you know, or or to the mud puddle or whatever. There, there's a verse in the Gita which, which says, you know, the, the sage sees the self in all beings and all beings in the self. But I think that all beings in the self includes not only beings, but everything. Because this, you know, the great sages describe that everywhere they look, they see the self. They see divine, the divine intelligence, um, you know, shining through the rock or the tree or the the sun or anything else they perceive. It's all one wholeness, Brahman, if you will, and that thou art. Um, it's just you know, we have kind of we're evolving toward that from a fragmented view to that holistic view. Um, how, how would you say uh, in your own journey that you um, uh, kind of came to some of these, you know, deep realizations that you, such as that that you just shared? Well, I started meditating about 53 years ago, and I've been doing it two or three hours a day ever since. And um, I've also been thinking about it and talking about it, teaching about it, and you know, just kind of dwelling on it. And so it's kind of a, I think it's a. I think there's two steps to spiritual development. One is experience and the other is understanding. And um, they kind of complement and supplement and s one another. And so that's the project that I've been on for most of this life. I think that uh, you've, you've highlighted something that's so important, which is a practice um, to have had uh, to sustain a practice that long. Um, to be faithful to it, uh, it it makes certain things possible that aren't po possible with a uh, a momentary revelation. As powerful as the revelation can might be, to to be able to ground it, and embody it, uh, bring it into your life, um, it 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 takes uh, a, a longer journey. Um, were there any particular books or teachers or uh, con circumstances that kind of set you in, in yeah. uh, on your path? Well, first of all, I, you know, in summer of 67, I took LSD for the first time, and that was a revelation just to see, you know, for many reasons that you understand, but also just the, the, the understand, the, the perspective that, whoa, the world isn't the same for everybody. It's, it's very different for each person. <laughs> and so the, you know, the name of the game seems to be to actually change the way you perceive it, not just to change the world. And, you know, I was reading Timothy Leary and Richard Alpert's Tibetan Book of the Dead interpretation that night and, you know, trying to figure out what bardo we were in and stuff. Uh, but, mm -hmm. but anyway, I, I stayed on that track for about a year and ended up messing myself up and dropping out of high school a couple of times and getting arrested a couple of times. And uh, uh, after that, I one night I picked up Zen Flesh, Zen Bones by Paul Reps. You may remember that book. And it's like three in the morning. And I'm reading this book stoned on something or other. And I thought, wow, you know, these guys are really serious and I'm just screwing around. And if I keep on like this, I'm not going to live very long or it's not going to go very well. So I thought, that's it. I'm going to quit drugs, learn meditation. And uh, I learned transcendental meditation and see what happens. And so I did, and right off the bat, it was very beneficial. My life changed quite dramatically very quickly, and soon I was back in college and getting a job, and I was a teacher within a couple of years, and, you know, I've just carried on ever since. But it hasn't been a great heroic discipline or anything because the experience was always so gratifying, particularly in contrast to what I'd been through. But, you know, each sitting of meditation has been blissful and rejuvenating for the most part, and it, it's just been this progressive, incremental growth over the years. That's great. What a what 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 a blessing that. I mean, I think uh, yeah, you could you could you could see how other contemporaries of yours could have had. Uh, you know, ha had some of the same experiences and then gone on a different some path. Some did. And some died. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And and so to have had the uh, the, you know, way, whether it was the the karma or the grace that would kind of intervene in that way and have you like read a certain thing at a certain time and get a, a certain awakening, uh, and still you had to act on it. Still you had to. 
um, but but I think the deep psyche, our, our deep soul, the spirit, the, the, the cosmos, however we want to think about it, the divine, it gives little little signals that we can be uh, alert to. And some of those signals could come in with the, uh, with the power of, um, you know, Paul being knocked off his horse uh, on his way to Damascus, but others are more subtle and just like, um, you, you, you kind of have to like, did I, you know, pay very close attention, like to this, this subtle music that you might ha have easily missed, but then you, you, kind of listen carefully and you kind of tease it out and follow it and then and I, I think again there's there's some inter it's a relationship it's a relational um, back and forth between you as a as an individual uh, consciousness and the whole that is calling you to um, connect with it, you know, uh, in some deep way. It, it's a, it's a kind of, it's a, it's, it's a journey. Yeah, and there's always been a sense, you know, in varying degrees of of clarity, but kind of ever ascending, that it's not just about me and what I can do to make myself happier. It's more like, how can I serve? You know, how can I be? Lord, let me be an instrument of Thy peace. Um, and ver very palpable sometimes that there's some kind of cosmic. Uh, role to play, you know, some sort of evolutionary um, role to play, and that it's there's a deep gratification in, in playing it. I know you feel that same way. I've heard you talking about, you know, writing your books and the other books you have in you, and you feel like you need to sort of get them out, you know, while you're still able to. And there's definitely a sense of, you know, what can I contribute, you know, to the evolution of the cosmos or to humanity in what you're doing. Right. Yeah. It's a, um, it's a, it's a, um, it's almost more important than, uh, than food, you know, I mean, you just to, to be able to, uh, yeah, to attend. In fact, I too often postpone or suppress my hunger feelings because I'm so into, part, you know, what I'm writing about or reading or thinking about uh, that I actually have to remember to keep the 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 physical side of me um, <laughs> attended great. you know nourished as yeah. well. Um, can I, I I'm just curious. I mean, you've had uh, I know a good number of the people I think that you've uh, interviewed over the years. Thinking about you know you mentioned Stan Groff uh, and of course Rupert uh, uh, Sheldrake who uh, you I I saw you do not too um, yep. not too long a year, ago. A couple years uh, maybe. Yeah. And um, I'm curious, as you look back upon all of these uh, many interviews, are there any that sort of stand out as being especially um, illuminating, exciting, unexpectedly uh, uh, brilliant or, uh, you know, anything that you can can recall out of your your vast uh, library of interviews? There? Oh, sorry. Uh, I hate to show favoritism. Um, right, right. You know, yeah, I know and you uh, and, you know. Like if you look on on the Bat Gap uh, past interviews menu, there's one of you know most popular interviews, and uh, in terms of the number of views on YouTube, mm -hmm. and you know there's some good ones in there that wouldn't necessarily be the way I would rank them, uh, but that seems to be what appealed to the most people. Um, but you know each one, you know, remember in high school where you you watched movies about like amoebas and you'd see this amoeba sort of going along and there'd be a little particle of food and it would kind of engulf the food and digest it and then they would go after another particle. I kind of feel like each, I'm, I'm, a, I'm an amoeba and each, <laughs> each guest is like a new particle of food <laughs> and uh, there's just something enriching. It fills new chinks in my, uh, you know, new gaps in or enlivens new areas in my understanding and experience to kind of dive into the world of each new person that I interview and immerse myself in it as much as I can over the course of a week and then have a conversation with them for a couple of hours. Um, so there have been a number of them and, you know, a number of them have become very good friends. You know, I've just found formed this network of friends around the world that I never would have met if I hadn't been doing this. Yeah, that, that's great. It's a very uh, uh, 
it's such an enriching thing personally i can imagine for for, for you uh to be and i think there's something well think of yourself that, teaching that, that, college all these years and all these wonderful students that you've interacted with and i'm sure that you've they've enriched you as much as you've enriched them not that i'm not much, that i'm yeah. in a student a teacher student relationship with the viva interview it's a different dynamic but you know similar principle right. Yeah, yeah, it's a. Uh, I mean, they happen to. In my case, they're they're graduate students, you know, doctoral uh, and master's students. But they, um, yeah, over these thirty years, it's definitely. Uh, I think Heidegger said the the um, the teacher is the person in the room who is learning the most. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, and yeah, I th I think um, we're. Stan, Stan uh, at Esalen would invite uh, each, he would have twice a year for a month, he would have these month long seminars where he would invite people like, <clears throat> you know, Fritz John Capra or, or, or um, Houston Smith or Ann Armstrong or Gene Houston or um, David Bohm, Rupert Sheldrake and so forth. And, and maybe uh, there might be a half dozen really great um, teachers that would come in <clears throat> each month uh and uh, so yeah there was just such a you're, you're just constantly being enriched by this um exchange of of, of new ideas uh it was such a blessing for you to thing, be able to hang out there for as long as you did so immersed in it boy what that, a what that, an experience yeah that 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 was a great blessing and it was just total i i had read uh when i was an undergraduate uh at at, at Harvard in the late 60s, I'd read a, an article in the Harvard Crimson that said uh, the headline was after Harvard Esalen. <laughs> the question yeah, mark. you took off the question and mark. I, I read, you know, I think I might have been the only person, you know, <laughs> who read it that actually went to Esalen and stayed there. Uh, but I, it was a, it was really my graduate school and, uh, and I, I took in uh, as, Certainly, as much as I received in Cambridge, I received in Big Sur uh, over those years, but on a, in a totally different way. One thing I, I appreciate about your deep dive into each um, person you're interviewing, where you just immerse yourself for a week or two in their their writings, their their interviews, and so forth, is that um, yeah, I can imagine that you come away from that week and then the the conversation itself with a sense of uh, yeah, just that your your soul's been expanded and enriched in a deeper way than if you just did, you know, read one book or had one uh, sustained conversation. That can be a lot, but it's different. To I, I know that my life has been greatly changed by wh who whatever thinker that I was being deeply inspired by to to kind of like read everything, you know, like I, I read everything that Tolstoy or Dostoevsky ever, ever wrote. Uh, and uh, it just, you know, or, you know, could be Jung or it could be um, Charles Taylor for me right now these days. Uh, and um, it's just such a, uh, an illumination of that you get by having that deep dive rather than a shallower yeah. exposure. It stretches you. I remember a uh... Last summer, I think it was, I interviewed Donald Hoffman. You you probably know Donald. And um, I, anyway, he's a fascinating guy, very brilliant. And I spent a whole week just kind of like walking a couple, in the woods for a couple hours every day, listening to talks that he was giving and, and you know, and then reading his stuff in the evening. And I, I felt like I really had to stretch to understand what he was saying and it almost my head almost hurt at one point because i mm. I'm just really stretching to get this guy but i by the end of the week i felt like i got it you know i understand what he's saying we had we had a great conversation so it really like you're saying tolstoy dostoevsky reading all these people it stretches you um i, I took a writing program years ago 85 or so and they say you want to be a good mm. writer you know read shakespeare read dostoevsky read the great writers and and it sort of it seeps into you yeah, yes. I I teach uh, um, a, a course or a class, uh, give a talk or workshop once a year to my students called uh, the Art and Discipline of Writing. And um, I think it's really uh, because we're particularly trying to cultivate in pe the people that are studying these ideas, also the ability to 
articulate those ideas in a way that uh, the intelligent general public can can hear them and understand them. So, you know, not to write just for uh, within the jargon of a, of a narrow academic specialization, but rather to reach a, a wider audience. Yeah. Uh, I think that's actually we, in a way an advantage for me in that I am I don't have an academic background. I don't have a really extensive education. And so I can kind of serve as a step down transformer in a way, <laughs> talking mm-hmm. to some of these people to kind of, you know, intermediate between a general audience and somebody who's a heck of a lot smarter than I am. Yes. But um, your your point I th- of how important it is to study the masters of of the art that you want to become good at, like uh, I I I like the idea of um, like Jane. If you read Jane Austen's language, it's so amazing. It's so I, I remember John Kenneth Galbraith said uh, that he always read some Jane Austen just before he began his day's mm. writing. Uh, because it's it, the pump. it it has that yeah it's just and it's just got he she has such a mastery of language a clarity of thought and uh every single word is perfectly chosen each sentence fits into the paragraph each paragraph into the larger chapter uh it's it's got that kind of intelligence that if you take it in each morning before a, a bit you know just read a few pages before you start it it helps to um uh, cultivate similar capacities in oneself yeah, you can train with her intelligence there's there's a right. saying that to which you give your attention grows stronger in your life right right which is uh um something to keep in mind when if if one might be t- uh tempted to binge watch <laughs> something that's not particularly high quality yeah. uh that would be important also there's the there's the problem of we need to face our the shadow side of existence and of our own shadows and at the same time not get swallowed by it um and nietzsche talks about that you know how you can get you gaze into the abyss too long and it can it can kind of swallow you uh so it it takes a, a certain balanced discernment about how to you know, open oneself and attend to the sides of existence that we might not really, you know, that we don't want to see. Uh, and yet at the same time to not become swallowed up by it, uh, where you lose um, the capacity for for hope, for um, being in a, uh, um, you know, to have that larger kind of healthy balance of life. Well, you know, if you take a handful of mud and drop it in a glass of water, you pretty much muddy up the water. But if you drop it in a bucket, then you don't muddy it so much. If you drop it in a swimming pool, then you don't muddy it so much. If you drop it in the ocean, you don't even, it just dissolves. So I think that, you know, while exploring the shadow, we need to at the same time move in the direction of oceanhood in terms of our consciousness, in yes. terms of our awareness. Then we'll be able to dissolve this stuff and and uh, not have it pollute our psychology. That's right. Yeah, I I was um, thinking about a Rumi uh, poem the other day where he talks about the not only uh, are we the drop part of the ocean, but the ocean is in the drop. The whole uh, we're not just in the ocean. The ocean is in us. Uh, uh, we're the whole, and that's why when one does a deep meditation or has a certain kind of uh, revelatory um, psychedelic experience or something like that, one can enter into. One feels that one's entering into the cosmos itself. Not you're you're not you're no you're not just inside your um, subjectivity. Yeah. One way of putting it is God is in everything and everything is in God. Mm -hmm. I want to do an abrupt gear shift here um, because there's this British philosopher named Jules Evans. I don't know if you've heard of him. And just yesterday, the day before, he sent out an email. I'm on his email list, a newsletter, in, in, in which he sort of said that he, is a, he has been in a secret astrology believer for years, but he's having some real serious doubts. And he mentioned you in the article. 
and uh, in a complementary way, as sort of the intellectual of the astrology world. And um, I, I emailed back and forth with him a little bit, and he he wanted me to ask you a couple of questions. So I'd like to ask a few kind of more skeptical hmm. questions about astrology for the sake of those who might be feeling skeptical. Um, one thing he said, that, you know, there's so many books explaining how astrology is supposed to have this, you know, you're able to interpret it this way and it's able to predict that or whatever. But he f he feels there's a paucity of information about how it's actually supposed to work. And the way he put it, and we've already kind of covered this, but we can cover it again a little bit. Does he really think these giant rocks emanate particular energies over particular areas of our life? If the universe God were so intelligent, why would it bother making one rock represent love, another rock represent communication, and so on? Why would, and then in a related, are these, we're in a related thing, why would God put our fate on the lines of our palms, you know? Um, and are these planets supposed to be alive, to be gods? I think that was the original idea. Um, and the entire system is founded on the fact that the constellation of Libra looks a bit like a scale, and someone thought Mars looked angry because its soil contains a lot of iron oxide, which is red. So you can see where he's coming from. Um, how sure. would you respond to those things? Um, well, there's a lot packed into that. Uh, one thing I would uh, point out, uh, I, like I like Rudolf Steiner's idea that... Um, Everything physical, everything material in, in the universe is an expression of a spiritual uh, being. Every, there's a spiritual dimension to everything. Um, Rupert Sheldrake has a whole uh, line of thought going about, you know, is the sun conscious, um, which uh, is a, um, a very interesting question given, given you know, even the physics of it and, and what, what the complexity of it and so forth. I, I don't myself have a, uh, a kind of x-ray vision into what I, I'm, I'm not a clairvoyant to, to be able to see what in, what is it about Mars or Venus or Saturn or Neptune that has this these this relationship to these great archetypal principles that can be ex experienced as gods and goddesses as they were by by the ancients or as uh, kind of platonic universals or you know platonic archetypal ideas uh cosmic principles as plato uh, would have seen them or uh as jung sees them as these you know deep psychological principles that are part of the collective archetypal unconscious that is is actually embedded in the material universe as well, and isn't just isn't just human. What is it about the planets that can um, that they can be correlated with with? I I think uh, it has to do with um, we all have a, a sense that the heavens are numinous. I think even the the most disenchanted astronomer who nevertheless uh, passionately follow, goes to the next uh, uh, full solar eclipse because there's something they're, they're, they're pulled by the, the, the power and beauty and the kind of cosmic magnificence of it. Uh, anytime we watch a dawn or a, a moonrise or a sunset, we, uh, or, or see a, a, a uh, an extraordinary, you know, like a conjunction of, of, of Venus and Jupiter uh, and the Moon in the in the sky. There's something, there's something numinous about it. We're, we we sense that there's more going on than just rocks uh, that are reflecting light. Or uh, it there's a, there's a um, the human response to it needs to be attended to that that's not coming out of nowhere our our the the idea that those are just rocks up there is to some extent an ex, an abstraction from our full experience uh and i think of of astronomers and mathematicians uh, as being in some sense uh um serving at the altar of 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 the cosmos they're drawn they're drawn to uh they they might not put it in um 
explicitly spiritual terms, but they often do. The sense of wonder, the sense of mystery, the sense of this is this has a spiritual meaning for me. I can't, you know, all I think uh, even the disenchanted mechanistic um, scientist is in some sense serving um, a an ensouled cosmos uh, and taking matter seriously is an important part of our evolutionary journey because part of our evolutionary journey was to go through a differentiation where we took just the spiritual as being important and the material was seen as being nothing but illusion or something to be transcended as soon as possible or it's a, a valley of tears uh, where we're being morally tested but the only thing that counts is the afterlife uh, and uh, and so forth in, in, and I think in some ways the evolution of human consciousness has entailed a reconnecting to the to the value of the of the material world of the physical natural world which our uh, indigenous um, uh, and uh, societies from the ancient past but also of the present have been carrying that capacity of of experiencing the value of this life and this and the natural world but in in an ensouled way so uh i think astrology is carrying that deeper longer term human intuition that uh the universe is both uh has both a physical and an, and and a soul dimension a spiritual dimension uh, and, and why wouldn't the universe in its incredible intelligence be willing to uh, uh, give us um, uh, indications of of its meaning. You know, we have the word meaning. That's a tricky word. Like, what what does meaning mean? Well, one of the things that meaning means is that something means something. So, someone, some in. Uh, conscious intelligence is signifying something is communicating something if you are mean i mean i mean this you know uh and if we live in a meaningful universe then the universe is a uh is a universe that is communicating meaning and it can communicate it through the movements of the of the uh, planets through the uh, cycles of the sun and the moon it can uh, express itself through uh, it's meaning through the p patterns of, of animal movements of the birds uh, that the the Native American can read. Uh, of life is t telling me something right now. This is how, and and the the people who can read palms or tea leaves or whatever, everything in the world is full of signs. The 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 universe is. Uh, symbolic through and through it's pregnant with meanings and 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 purposes so uh that being said it is still an astonishment to me that astrology works uh i it's a daily uh revelation of wow that the universe i mean i in, in my book cosmos and psyche i kind of packed in you know countless uh synchronicities basically of patterns that are quite compelling both in terms of um, convergences of very similarly patterned uh, uh, events in many cultures across the world at the same time, but also in diachronic ways, according to in coincidence with the cycles of, of certain planets uh, as they come into conjunction or opposition. And um, all, all of those represent uh, a kind of I think uh, a revelation of the universe's deeper intelligence and 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 uh, spiritual and soul and souled depths that it's it is uh, using the movements of the planets. I think in relationship to the Earth to at this point, I think help awaken humanity to the fact that it's embedded in a, an intelligent cosmos that cares about the earth and that cares about this 
each human being on it, each being on it, each moment is in some sense a focus of cosmic meaning. I think that's a deep message, and it's similar to what happens at in human life when we have experiences at, at major th critical thresholds of our life, like facing death or births or um, uh, moments of great spiritual transformation. Synchronicities tend to occur. Uh, meaningful coincidences seem to converge with an unusual uh, potency, both in number and in quality. And those synchronicities that seem to uh, kind of accelerate, in the, they, they're like communications from the deep psyche to, kind of, I think of them as you know, helping to orient us and, and to uh, remind us that we're not alone in a certain way. But at the astral, in terms of the astrological, you know, Jung called astrology. It's like it, it, it's synchronicity on a grand cosmic scale in some sense. That's one way of looking at it. And why would synchronicities be coming in to the modern mind that has been living in a disenchanted universe for the last several hundred years? Well, it could be that the modern mind is going through a critical threshold in which it, in some sense, needs to awaken out of its slumber of feeling that it lives in a disenchanted mechanistic universe of, of just rocks and gaseous planets and so forth. And instead uh, that we are um, participating in uh, a, a magnificent uh, and a magnificently intelligent uh, spiritual mystery. Yeah, beautiful. Um, one way I come to terms with all this is to take Rupert's question, is the sun conscious, and rephrase it slightly to say, the sun is consciousness, everything is. And um, everything um, obviously seems to have a material existence to it, but there's a range from the gross material through various subtler strata down to pure consciousness or pure intelligence. Now that's all pervading but then things arise as forms in you know, specific locations. And whenever there's a significant form, like the sun or Neptune or you know, uh, anything, um, or even a small insignificant form of a wildflower, it's not insignificant, but a small thing, um, there are, there's a whole, it's not only what meets the eye on the surface level, but there's a whole range of subtler levels to its existence. And intelligence permeates and orchestrates that whole range and exists in its pure state at the foundation of it. Uh, but I'm getting a little long-winded here. But um, you could say that every gross form has a subtle counterpart or a subtle body. And a significant form like the sun, and even, even flowers. I mean, they say that there's a flower deva or something that's in charge of that flower, but a, a, a major thing like the sun or a planet would have, it seems to me, a rather powerful or profound subtle body. And so, you know, you can kind of actually get back to understanding why the ancients thought of these bodies as gods, the sun, the moon, all these different things. Obviously, it's just the sun is a fusion, re fusion reaction and the moon is a big hunk of rock and, and so on, but on the subtler levels, um, and we can just take this as a conjecture or a hypothesis, on subtler levels there could very well be a, an intelligent entity, as it were, that is embodied within that gross form. And if, if that's true, if we think of it that way, <clears throat> then you know, it might help to understand astrology better because we have all these sort of powerful, intelligent entities sort of doing a dance around us and reorienting, be, being reoriented in relationship to us. And I don't know if we want to get back to thinking that they're influencing us or that the whole thing is just part of a larger sort of clockwork and, you know, we're part of the dance too. But it's easier perhaps to see how their positions relative to ours might be significant. Yes, I think... Uh... And, and what you're call, talking about in terms of maybe at subtler levels, they, they are much more than just these mater, material uh, objects. Um, there are modes of consciousness that I think ancient humanity had 
had easier access to uh, and that um, some of us can access in non-ordinary states of consciousness, uh, well, all of us can, uh, when given the, um, the the grace to have that kind of a, an epiphany, um, we can we we can experience them that way, and it's not it's a type of empiricism. It's not like uh, uh, only conjecture. It can be it can be yeah. felt uh, and experienced in quite a quite a vivid way. Um, so yeah, I and I I, I think um, the the meeting of you. I mean, you ha- you have to. I I can sympathize with your uh, your friends state of of questioning uh even though he's drawn towards the it seems sounds like he's been drawn very much towards the uh something about the astrological disclosure has been drawing him yeah for, he's uh, he's been into time. it for decades but he's just beginning to yeah. he's going through this period where he thinks yeah what have i been doing this for you <laughs> yeah well i think you know in um, it was kind of the reverse uh, s- sequence for me, but with um, for both Stan Groff and myself, you know, we we were even though at, at Esalen, just about every imaginable esoteric, uh, spiritual, mystical path uh, and discipline and perspective was being taught at one time or another during the years that we were there. But astrology seemed like kind of the last one that we uh, were thinking we would take uh, deeply seriously, but, you know, we were working on a particular, you know, many philosophical and scientific breakthroughs take place when you're dealing with a problem and you're trying to come up with a, uh, a, a way of meeting that problem. And in our case, the problem was in the area of psychedelic therapy, different individuals could take this exact same substance, the exact same dosage level, and have radically different experiences. In the case of LSD, it could be, uh, you know, one person could be in heaven, the other person could be quite literally in hell, uh, or and everything in between. And, uh, and a person can have existential desperate uh, panic attack, you know, while another person is experiencing being n- nourished by uh, the the exquisite beauty of life that suddenly is of he or she can see. And uh, both Stan and I were questioning, like, what, what is there? Is there any way that we can get some intimation of how a person might respond in advance? Because there's the stakes are high if you're working with a patient population, um, how they're going to respond to these powerful substances. But none of the standard psychological tests, like the um, Rorschach or the thematic apperception test, the TAT or the MMPI, uh, n- none of them had any predictive value uh, for understanding either how two individuals might respond to the same substance, but nor uh, the same individual at different times, because as you know, you can have a very different experience three months from now or a year from now than the one that you you had today um, using the same substance and the same dosage level. So uh, someone at Esalen in one of our uh, workshops, or it was actually in one of Stan's month-long seminars, who was an artist, but who who had studied astrology for many years. And he said in his experience, people's uh, ongoing daily uh, life experience, as well as major um, crises and, and breakthroughs and so forth, the timing of those seems to correlate with where the planets are relative to where they were at a person's birth. And uh, he convinced us to um, an, enough to be able to, where we, we learned how to calculate the birth charts and calculate transits. And uh, we had very good records for our own uh, LSD sessions, as well as we had, you know, uh, Esalen was such a kind of living laboratory of people going through transformational experiences that we just had so many um uh, we had such a great database to draw on, and we, so we we did the calculations, and then we looked at the the astrological textbooks about what kinds of experiences are likely to happen under 
this transit versus that transit. And it, the correlations were so consistent and so um, impressive uh, that it made us uh, st start studying it more systematically uh, until, um, you know, we we came to realize that this was like the well as, as stan said um archetypal astrology is like the is like uh, uh the um rosetta stone of the human psyche it 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 allow it it provides us with a way of reading the deep um it it connects the the deep unfolding uh, geometry of meaning of the cosmos uh, to the archetypal language of the human psyche uh, in a way that allows us to track um, both our own kind of lifelong dispositions, but also our, our ongoing um, shifting archetypal dynamics of our lives. And then also to see it at the collective level, like what was that's that's the thing that this um, changing of the gods documentary series is going to focus on is, you know, the, the collective historical level is what was going on in the 60s and why is there so much so such a, a close relationship between what happened in the 60s and what's been going on recently over the last uh, several years and how does that connect to the French Revolutionary Epoch and so forth. Uh, and so. Yeah, it it it's we found that the collective or world transits were extraordinarily important for understanding even psychedelic experiences too. Mm. If you think of it, when that documentary series comes out, let me know and I can provide a link to it on your Batgap page. Okay, that's a good idea. There's a couple of questions I came up with um, that I've just been wondering about. It, you know, if we if we send people to the moon or Mars and and children are born there. Would we be able to devise astrological systems to suit those locations? Well, um, of course, it's all speculation, but on the basis of what we see on, on the Earth, um, the location on the Earth is um, seems to play a role in, you know, for example, uh, I was born in, in Geneva, Switzerland, and uh, at the time, and it was you know pretty close to noon, but uh, and so the all the planets and the sun uh, and moon at that point were positioned in a certain way relative to the horizon. But if I'd been born right at that exact same moment, same day uh, and year, but in in New York or in um, you know uh, Johannesburg, um, I would I would have a whole different. Um, uh, I mean, many things would be the same. The, the the geometrical alignments of the planets relative to each other would be the same, but relative to the horizon of the Earth and the you know the vertical axis, they would shift depending on where you were in the Earth. Well, and and those those changes um, are visible in terms of the correlations. A, a person who has a, a planet at the midheaven tends to have um, certain archetypal energies related to that planet a little more. Um, uh, they, they express themselves in, in certain, often very public ways or in ways that are more related to one's work in the world, etc. So uh, the reason I bring this up is that if we were to imagine someone born at a, at a, uh, on another planet, there would be, we would have to be measuring the planetary positions, the other planets uh, and the sun, um, and perhaps multiple moons if we're, if you're dealing with Jupiter or something like that, uh, you'd have to measure that uh, according to its, the relative positions to that place in Jupiter, uh, on Jupiter or on Mars. Um, so, and then there's the whole question of, the Earth seems to have a certain character. You know, it's 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 gotten a name over the last. Uh, I mean, it's gotten the rebirth of a name, Gaia, uh, over over the last half century, and even a certain quality. One of my um, 
uh, one of my other colleagues, Sean Kelly, is just publishing a book on on uh, coming home to Gaia and uh, a kind of emergence of a planetary consciousness may, seems to be happening in certain ways, which I see as part of this initiatory rite of passage and death rebirth experience that we're going through. Uh, but um, would living on Mars have a different meaning? Uh, you know, would your would your foundation be different because it's Mars rather than the Earth? I would think so, um, but I, I couldn't, it's all speculation. So I think it's an interesting question, but not one that um, I have the slightest sense that I would could give an authoritative answer. Yeah, well, obviously, yeah, it would have to be speculative. But I, I would think that every planetary system in the universe, if astrology is valid, would have its own astrological system based upon the configurations of the star or stars and, and planets in that system. That, and by the same, that, that's yeah, right. by the same token, it, it would almost seem that perhaps galaxies or clusters of galaxies or super clusters would have their own astrologies that correlate um, with events in their respective time and distance scales, you know? That, yes, and it could be entirely different structures of meaning. Yeah. I mean, just completely. Uh, uh, we, you know, Terence McKenna uh, used to say that um, the, the, the search for ec uh, extraterrestrial intelligence out in the universe by by tracking radio signals is like trying to uh, look for a a good italian restaurant out there um it's like why um why radio signals i mean there it could be many different ways in which other other intelligences in the universe might want to uh communicate or their the way in which they communicate so um, I think we have to keep a pretty open mind about what's out there. Yeah. All right. So let me ask a final question, and that is, um, maybe I could get you to prognosticate a little bit. I mean, um, you know, we're all wondering what's what the world is going through and where it's going to end up in 5, 10, 20 years. Um, you and I are 71, and... Um, you know, if we're lucky, we might live in real lucky. We might live another 30 years. So, I mean, how do you see things going in both in terms of your your understanding of history and the, the changing changes of cultures throughout history and in terms of your understanding of astrology, putting those together? Do you have any ability to sort of, you know, prognosticate a bit about the coming decades? I can see in terms of uh, the current decade that we have just entered into that um, you know we're coming out of a very powerful and challenging um, it's the Pluto square Uranus in the sky. Uh, it's the which is the first alignment uh, of what we call dynamic or hard uh, aspects since the 1960s of the same two planets from 60 to 72 or so when they were in orb, as we say, in range of, uh, of exact alignment uh, to that correlates with these archetypal expressions in, in human life. And it's like these big archetypal waveforms seem to come in during certain you know, alignments of the planets. And we're, we're right now in a quite a dramatic transitional stage uh, involving three of the planets, Saturn, uh, Uranus and Pluto, and uh, all in hard aspect, and it's a it's a um, it's a critical time. These are typically transits when crises tend to happen. Uh, it's, it's volatile, tensions of opposites, um, need for uh, kind of volcanic. There there are like volcanically intense evolutionary pressures pressing for the um for the radical reconfiguration of, of of all life structures i mean that's basically the way to summarize kind of what we're what we're going through right now in terms of the world transits but what's interesting is that as uh starting you know roughly around 2023 24 um those two planets are going to Uranus and Pluto will move into a trine relationship which is a 120 degree more harmonious um uh, configuration 
uh, when the same energies of kind of evolutionary drive and uh, movement towards uh, change, breakthrough, uh, experiment, etc., tends to happen in a in a less fraught way than we've been going through for the last uh, decade, and um, depending on you know everything depends on the the present, like how we respond to the these critical uh, energies that are constellated right now, that will uh, set the that will create the foundation for whatever can unfold over the rest of the decade. Uh, so much will depend on uh, the degree to which humanity uh, will respond to um, the the present need. Uh, and I have to say the last three months have been encouraging uh, compared to the preceding uh, four years in, in <laughs> our country, the United yeah. States, uh, you know, to finally have you know, uh, some modicum of sanity and competence and, and compassion in the, in the White House uh, is very encouraging. And, you know, even though we might want, excuse me, um, we might want more, um, even more uh, to be able to unfold, let's say, in terms of uh, shift in our environmental policies and corporate uh, uh, policies and so forth. Uh, tremendous amount of work needing to be done in terms of economic, social, ecolo ecological justice. Um, that being said, uh, I, I remain uh, hopeful that um, in a sense that the, the crisis of conscience that our country and many other countries in the world have gone through uh, in in recent years, combined with the kind of vital emergency that the climate crisis is, is producing for uh, our uh, collective consciousness, could produce a, a, a significant transformation uh, in our, um, the, the fact that there is this um, uh, this pressure for change, uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful that we could uh, reorient, you know, our way of being in the world on the basis of a kind of mm, moral and psycho-spiritual transformation that many people have been going through, even under the COVID uh, uh, pandemic um, circumstances. There's been, I think, a lot of self-reflection that's been uh, going on. Uh, people in, in seclusion may be doing a little more thinking uh, about what's important in their lives and how they're going to live their lives. Uh, so uh, it's very difficult. You know, I, I think uh, it was Mark Twain said, if you ever get the uh, urge to predict the future, you should take a nap. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I, I take that advice as being very wise. So I, I am not a, in a position to predict the future, but I have a sense of hope. Uh, and I see hope as playing a role, not just, it's not like a kind of rational optimism on the basis of our best evidence. Um, hope is more of almost like a spiritual virtue that you have to cultivate. And it's a, it reflects, I think, a... Um, a sense of the universe's capacity for love, and for um, and and therefore our capacity to trust in its unfolding, uh, in ways that we can't predict, in ways that we can't see on our horizon right now, uh, and we need to act to the best of our ability with um, what we can see right now, uh, but with perhaps a certain. Um, trust in the cosmos, trust in life that allows us to take the chance to um, do things that might not uh, have their reward in our lifetime, um, that might uh, bear fruit um, only under cer certain circumstances in a, in a future decade, a future century. Yeah, even. Seven generations. But, yeah. So... Uh, I think hope can be seen as, in some sense, a it's like a seed 
that we can plant in the future that can draw us um, toward it in in a, like the, the it it or you could see see it as a future the future planting a seed in us that we cultivate and we um, uh, move towards actualizing through the hard labor of of of, of life. Um, each of us has to do it in a different way. We each have to kind of pay attention to the the, the intimations that we get in our psyche of uh, in our soul's life uh, about what what is calling us. What's what feels right for us to do? Where do we feel a certain joy? Where do we feel that life is most um, vitally uh, alive, engaged in our in in our being? And those are probably the ways that life is asking us to flower. Um, so maybe that's a good good place to yeah, end. Yeah, no, that was a great answer, very wise and nuanced. So wonderful. Really appreciate it. Let me just show your website on the screen here. So it's uh, cosmosandpsyche.com, is it? or Yes. Cosmosandpsyche.com. And I'll be, I'll be linking to it from your page on that gap. Um, so... Thank you so much. You were using my amoeba analogy. You were a very nourishing morsel to engulf. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Glad, glad to be of service. Uh, and 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 hope hopefully uh, others who hear our conversation will find some value in yeah. it. Yeah. Please give my regards to Stan Groff and um, if he remembers me and yes. and Brian Swim and tell Brian anytime he wants to come on, just let us know. I haven't had him on the show okay. yet. Okay, I will. I'll pass it on in both cases. Great. All right, take care. Thanks, Richard. And thanks to those who've been listening or watching. Um, you know the drill, batgap.com. Go there and check out all the menus and um, you'll see what's what. I don't want to keep Richard any longer. So uh, next week, who is next week? Oh, a, a very interesting Sufi gentleman from South Africa will be my guest next week. So stay tuned for that. Thanks again, Richard. You're welcome. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.